we realize that the pain points for general practitioners a lot of times lie in interpreting these tests. So I wanted to start off with just giving you a basic scenario that I think is pretty common. And that the patient that was in the hospital that got a slew of tests ordered um, and they're now being seen by their PCP in the clinic and they have an SPEP that shows a monoclonal protein. And now the, the PCP is really tasked with trying to figure out what to do with that information. So how do we interpret the basic testing, um, including SPEPs, immunoglobulins, SPEP immunofixation, and free light chains? Sure. So to start off, you know, what we're talking about are clonal plasma cell disorders. Uh, these are plasma cell proliferative disorders that arise from a single clone. And um, just as we see with any other cancer, you have the pre-malignancy, which will be monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, and then the full-blown malignancy on the other end of the spectrum, which is multiple myeloma. Plasma cells, by virtue of their nature being immunoglobulin-secreting cells, when you have a clone, it's not just that the clone is going to expand and cause a malignancy, that's the problem, but also that the clone is going to make immunoglobulins, which are active antibodies, and uh, can be easily detected. And so you have uh, a secreted product on top of the clone increasing in size. Plasma cell disorders are quite common. About 5% of the general population in the United States above the age of 50 will have a monoclonal protein. And the monoclonal protein is simply the antibodies made by a single clone of cells, and, it, and they're all of the same, same type, so they really stick out like a church spire on an electrophoresis gel. So um, since it's so common, Anytime you order an SPEP, you have a 1 in 20 chance somebody's going to have a monoclonal protein. So I usually say order the test when you're suspecting multiple myeloma or related plasma cell disorder like amyloidosis or Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and not to do the test just as part of a routine workup because you will be faced with a positive test that you're not sure how quite to interpret. The serum protein electrophoresis is basically you take proteins in your, you take your blood, spin it down, and you uh, separate the proteins in the blood uh, across an electrical field. So they migrate according to their size. And normally you will see albumin, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, and then the gamma globulin region where the immunoglobulins migrate to. There will be a nice bell-shaped curve, like a Gaussian distribution almost of the normal immunoglobulins, because we make immunoglobulins of all kinds and sh sizes and shapes. But if you have a clonal plasma cell disorder, they could all be the same type. And so then you end up getting a church spire or a very tall peak, which is called a monoclonal protein. So the SPEP will report to you in, in patients who have a positive monoclonal protein that a protein like that was detected. It'll also tell you how much protein was detected. So it'll give you a, a number with the size of that. The <clears throat> immunofixation is just like the protein electrophoresis, where we run several lanes, and in each lane you add an antibody against IgG, IgM, IgA, kappa, lambda. And so if you see a monoclonal protein, looking at the immunofix, you can tell based on which bands are reacting. Is it IgG kappa? Is it IgG lambda? And so on. So the SPEP tells you, is there a monoclonal protein? If so, how much? The immunofixation tells you, is there a monoclonal protein? If so, what type? And because light chains can be excreted down the urine, if a plasma cell was making only light chains, those light chains can get filtered in the kidney, and so you will miss it. Therefore, the free light chain assay helps you pick up those people who have just light chain only problems. So that's in a nutshell, <clears throat> MGAS and the three common tests that we do. Keep in mind, if you suspect multiple myeloma and you did all these three tests, the SPEP will be positive only 80% of the time because 
20% of the time, either the patient has only light chains or the M spike is too small to be seen on the SPAP. The immunofixation will increase your sensitivity to 93%. You will still miss the people who have only light chain type of myeloma that's coming out in the urine. So you, if you do all three tests, you'll pick up 98% of multiple myelomas. So that's why when you know you're looking for something, order the three tests. And based on the result, you can say with confidence whether somebody is likely to have myeloma or not. Of course, there'll be one or two percent who have multiple myeloma, but they're not really making any immunoglobulins because the cell is, is malignant, so it's not normal. Uh, and in those patients, you'll need biopsies of the bone. After you order the first three tests, the SPEP uh, with immunofixation and the free light chains, uh, when should you add on the urine studies, the UPEP or the 24-hour urine collection? When you find that the patient probably has a monoclonal protein based on the serum protein electrophoresis, immunofixation, and the free light chain assay, in general, we recommend getting a baseline urine protein electrophoresis, a 24-hour urine protein electrophoresis with immunofixation of the urine. Now, sometimes the paraprotein is so small and I know it is an MGUS and it looks like an MGUS that we might say, like, ignore it. But in general, we recommend getting a baseline so that in the future, if something happens, you'll know where the baseline was. Also, because sometimes the free light chains can dimerize, and there are occasional patients in whom the free light chain level is quite high. But it's not because the plasma cells are making it. It's just because the chi light chains have dimerized and they're not getting excreted in the urine. So if you see a discordance, like the light chains are high in the serum, but there's hardly anything in the urine, it actually reassures you that this patient is not a high-risk smoldering myeloma or a high-risk MGUS. It's just one of those patients who's dimerizing. So I always try to get that as well. So you have a good baseline and make sure you get a 24-hour UPEP with the immunofixation and not the 24-hour light chains or the 24-hour free light chains. Those tests are not analytically reliable. That's very helpful. Yeah. Sitting with the free light chains, because I was on service two weeks ago and I texted Nate, um, because it, for I think typically in the hospital, it's like, oh, new heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Let's send the full workup of causes and UPEP, SPEP gets sent. And then for one of my patients, I'm going to read her protein electrophoresis. Her free kappa was 106. Uh, her free lambda was 48. The ratio was 8.18. 8 and the immunoglobulin GAM was negative. And then I don't think there was any monoclonals on the immunofixation. Um, can you walk us through how one interprets those Absolutely. Number one, the free light, serum free light chain assay is a brilliant assay because what it does is it only measures the light chains that are circulating free, unbound to the immunoglobulin. Because the immunoglobulin itself has two kappa and lambda light chains. And so if this assay was even slightly off, it will start measuring those. And those are in the thousands of milligrams per deciliter. It consists of two assays, the kappa and the lambda. Serum-free kappa, serum-free lambda. Now, I usually tell people our body is just so well regulated that this immunoglobulin molecule, which is actually synthesized from many genes, there's such high control over this that all of us make, like, say, 1,000 milligrams per deciliter of IgG, but we'll have only, like, one milligrams or two milligrams per deciliter of kappa free. So we are really good about making only the amount of light chains we need. We don't make extra. But all of us do have normal serum kappa level and a norm, norm, normal serum free lambda level. And normally there is a ratio. The ratio is 0 0.26 to 1.65. That's a pretty tight range in which all of us have. When you have renal failure, the level of kappa and lambda will both go up, and they'll go up because the kidney is no longer able to excrete all the light chains. They accumulate, and so the serum-free light chain ratio will levels will go up. 
In the past, we thought that even in renal failure, because both levels are going up, the ratio will still stay in the normal range. But now we realize that the ratio is somewhat perturbed as well. Because, you know, it's not like the kidneys excreting everything equally. And so what happens is the reference range is not quite the 0.26 to 1.65 that the lab reports. So your patient has a high kappa, high lambda, but the ratio is almost close to normal, like 2.18, which is close to 1.65. And so up to 4... I think is just normal. So in your patient's case, I'll just say, patient's got an elevation of serum-free kappa and lambda with a very borderline abnormal ratio that's consistent with just renal failure. It's within the renal reference range. And so reassure them that there is no clonal plasma cell disorder. I'm even more confident because you have other metrics, your IgGA and M are normal, there's no serum monoclonal protein. I'm more confident that's what's going on. It's very easy to reassure them. Now, if you have a monoclonal process, what will happen is the kappa will be out of proportion to the lambda or the lambda will be out of proportion to the kappa. Usually, it'll be kind of like night and day, not like so close to the normal range. And in up-to-date recently, as well as in the Annals of Internal Medicine article, unilaterally, I've said like, don't worry about free, free light chain ratios that are less than eight. If you do your reference range, it'll be 0.125 to 8.0. That'll reduce the number of referrals. And, and it could be monoclonal, but it's not like going to cause a problem. It's very low risk. And if there are no other red flags, even if it's a clonal problem, you can just, you know, say it's probably a very low risk MGUS and leave it alone. Is there anything else that's a for kidney disease that makes uh, the sensitivity or specificity of these tests not as great that we should be? Uh, oh, yeah, body. absolutely. So anyone with a bad inflammation, infection, autoimmune disease that can cause a polyclonal hypergammaglobulinemia will also have elevated free light chains. But usually, again, the kappa and the lambda will both go up about the same. And the ratio, if at all is perturbed, will be pretty close to that reference range. I mean, don't worry about ratios that are, that are less than eight unless there is a clear M spike. And, uh, and, and don't worry about uh, patients with renal failure or inflammatory diseases having slightly high uh, kappa lambda levels as long as the ratio is within the close range. You can reassure them, oh, it's just a polyclonal process. Treat the underlying pro- problem, whatever it is. And, and that makes a lot of sense because during infections, our body makes immune cells. and makes immunoglobulins, so it makes a ton of sense. For patients with um, let's say an IgG uh, M guts. What levels of immunoglobulins would concern you, or uh, are there specific cutoffs that make you concerned enough to do more workup to see if there's something else there, such as smoldering myeloma or multiple myeloma? Oh, great question. So the general guideline is if you have an IgG M guts with level that is less than 1.5 grams per deciliter of M spike and the light chain ratio that is in the normal range, the lifetime risk of progression to myeloma-related disorder is only like 2%. So it's not even 1% per year. So it's like 0.1% per year. So what we recommend is just always recheck in six months to make sure you're not catching something just as it's taking off. And then if that's stable, then you can just check it only if symptoms occur in the future. You don't need a baseline bone marrow. You don't need a baseline bone survey. And those are based on studies done in Italy where they looked at patients with small IgG MGUS with a normal light chain ratio, did a bone marrow on everybody and a bone survey on everybody and looked at how often was it even abnormal. And it's hardly ever abnormal. So you are just unnecessarily doing those tests. So we say if something is bothering you, like something's not right, definitely go for the workup, regardless of the M spike size. One gram, you'll still do it because you think, no, I think this patient could have myeloma because their calcium's high or something. But uncomplicated MGUS, IgG, less than 1.5, normal light chain ratio, 
half of the MGUS is out there. You can omit the bone marrow at baseline empirically. You can omit the um, bone survey at baseline, call them as possibly MGUS, recheck in six months. If that's stable, then it confirms your diagnosis and leave them alone after that. I have recently expanded this group to also include small IgM MGUSs. This IgM hardly ever becomes myeloma. If at all it progresses, it'll be like a Waldenstrom's, which is an even more indolent disease. And then finally, the people who have light chain only MGUS, in the sense the serum SPEP and immunofixation are negative with no IgG, A, or M, um, but the light chain ratio is abnormal. So if it's less than eight, I say omit the bone marrow, omit the bone survey, just recheck in six months, and if it's stable, leave them alone. So again, you're expanding the whole cohort of MGUS that you'll work up to something like 20, 30%. And then that group, you can really get a baseline bone marrow, bone survey, repeat in six months, and then once a year thereafter. Great. Thank you. That was very clear. And one specific cohort of patients the general practitioner might see a frequent amount is a patient that technically meets the criteria for one of uh, the crab whether it's the anemia or renal dysfunction. Um, but we don't think that necessarily the polyclonal disorder is driving that issue. There might be a plausible alternative explanation, such as diabetes or hypertension. In those patients with uh, a level less than 1.5, would you still recommend additional workup, such as a bone marrow biopsy or a skeletal survey? No, I wouldn't. I mean, unless it bothers me. If I have a clear explanation why the patient is anemic or why their calcium is high or whatever the renal function dysfunction is due to, then I wouldn't attribute it to the plasma cell pro proliferative disorder. So the key, key point with the myeloma diagnostic criteria is that the hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, and bone lesion must be felt related to the plasma cell disorder. If I have a good explanation for the anemia or a good explanation for the renal failure, then we are not compelled to blame the plasma cell disorder for that. But on the other hand, if something is not right, it's not making sense. The patient has renal failure, but it's only like 1.8. And why is there anemia at like 8 and 9 grams per deciliter? It doesn't add up. Um, I don't have any other explanation. Then you would do a bone marrow just to be sure that you're not missing a a plasma cell disorder where the bone marrow is involved out of proportion to how much it's actually secreting uh, because there are these oligosecretory myeloma patients. But to answer your question, it's a judgment call. And we try to tell people, you make good judgment calls if you know the patient well. So monoclonal gammopathy can cause renal failure by causing glomerulonephritis, not just myeloma, but just a separate problem. So you look at the whole picture and again, anytime you're in doubt, just get the marrow and the bone survey to make sure. So keep your eyes open. And if you're worried about the patient, forget the M-spike. If it's small, big, it doesn't matter. Just get it done. 